during the 16th and 17th century, these guys were guerrillas fighting against the Afghans, fighting against the Turks. Uh, and in fact, our family deity is called Yavana Mardini Kali. So, the Sanyals and the wider clan, the Sanyal Lahiri clan, they also participate in this. So, for example, they begin to modernize yoga. So, modern Kriya Yoga also comes from the same family. You may have heard of Lahiri Mahashoy in many cases. Lahiri Mahashoy, by the way, is the same family as Sachindranath Sanyal's grand uncle. By the way, North Block and South Block have various escape routes uh, uh, designed specifically to escape re revolutionaries. So, he recruits all these people whose names you may have heard. This is the time when he recruits uh, Ram Prasad Bismil, Rajendra Lahiri, Ashwakullah Khan, Bhagat Singh, who was a college student, um, Sukhdev, uh, Sukhdev uh, Rajguru, Chandrasekhar Azad, who was a young kid in Varanasi in Sanskrit college. These people, all of whose names you know, are actually recruits of Sachindranath Sanyal, uh, which is one of the reasons that Chandrasekhar Azad got killed in Allahabad some years later, because he was coming to our house bef before he got uh, identified by a writer called Yashpal, by the way. Well, it's a uh, bit puzzling uh, feeling. I'm hosting the patron of the <laughs> of the of the lit fest, uh, but it's always I, I will keep my uh, comments to the very minimum because all of you are here to hear to hear Sanjeev the talking, and you know how you feel when he talks. But I'll be actually representing you. I will be just uh, I will try to give a structure, represent your questions because here we are talking about a book. Uh, this is Bandi Jeevan, which was uh, written which, uh, by one of the greatest revolutionaries of our freedom movement. The unfortunate fact is that we don't know much about these great men. Sachindranath Sanal was a remarkable man who saw very interestingly different phases of the independence struggle. The revolutionary phase, the post-revolutionary phase, he was sent to Kalapani twice. He worked with the top leadership in the country. He formed the organization which later on brought in Bhagat Singh uh, and, 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 and created such an impact that we are still talking about it today. But unfortunately, they have been suppressed. They have been marginalized from the mainstream narrative. So this is the man we are going to talk about. Of, of course, I mean, it's a book which he started writing in 1922 and uh, later on added more parts, but the man himself was much more than this book. So we will talk about this book and also try to uh, know more about the man. So Sanjeev, the, to start with the fact that Sachindranath Sanal is remarkable because he represented the revolutionary uh, legacy outside Bengal. When we talk about revolutionary movement, we think about Bengal, the Dhaka Anushilan Samiti, the Jugantar in Kolkata, some parts in Punjab, some in Maharashtra. But here we see the uh, revolutionary center, which was the second revolutionary center, actually Banaras. And he is working in Banaras, in Patna. He's moving to Uttar Pradesh, to Punjab, and covering a very wide range. So before we get into his activities, why don't you tell us uh, briefly about his background? Why, how did he burst into this scenario? How, how did he get into the revolutionary movement? So, um, as you pointed out, I mean, the Sanyal family, so he's my grand uncle. So, this is this book is really uh, my grand uncle's book, which uh, was there as he wrote it originally, by the way, in Bangla. And because he was from Varanasi, he translated it into, got it translated into Hindi, which he knew quite well. Uh, and then it was translated into multiple languages, including into Punjabi, for example, by Bhagat Singh, who translated this book, Bandi Jeevan. And it's about his struggles to create this revolutionary sort of armed revolt against the British. That's what this book is about. And of course, he was repeatedly sent to jail. So the question is, why was he doing all of this? And why were the Sanyals, who are Bengali, by the way, what were they doing in Varanasi? So the reason they are in Varanasi is quite interesting in its own, own right. So let me tell you a little about, about the Sanyal clan. See, the Sanyals are <coughs> essentially from an area called Barendra Bhum, which is now mostly in Bangladesh, 
which is the area very close to where the Ganga and the Brahmaputra meet. So it's a very marshy kind of area, lots of small islands um, and that kind of place. And the Sanyas were basically known to be both scholars and rebels. And so during the 16th and 17th century, these guys were guerrillas fighting against the Afghans, fighting against the Turks. Uh, and in fact, our family deity is called Yavana Mardini Kali. And so one of the things my family was infamous for doing is to catching hold of their, whoever they happen to be being guerrillas against and basically decapitating them <laughs> uh, as a, as a, uh, as something as an offering as to, an offering, offering to Kali. So they were feared. They were also famous for being scholars of the, of the Nyaya school of philosophy. Uh, so, what is now today called Navanyaya, the modern form of Nyaya, was also something that they were reviving. So now, having fought the Afghans, uh, fought the Turks, and then coming to some sort of an accommodation with the uh, Mughals, um, they then faced themselves in the 18th century being conquered by the British. And so they're still rebellious. But this is the context in which some other things are going on. So, for example, the Marathas are rebuilding Varanasi. And everybody knows about Ahilya by Holkar and rebuilding of, of the Kashi Vishwanath temple. So, there was also a Bengali contribution to this. Which How did they land up in Varanasi? From ah, Varanasi? So, basically there was a queen in Bengal called Rani Bhavani of Natur. And she sponsored a bunch of Bengalis, which included the Sanyals to go to Varanasi at the time that Ahilya Bhai Holkar was building the Kashi Vishwanath temple. So my ancestors moved there somewhere in the 1780s and witnessed the rebuilding of this uh, Kashi Vishwanath temple. And then they set up a Vedic school called uh, Tola, that's called. And so there's an area of Varanasi even today called Bengali Tola, which is named after my family. And so Vedic school, people may think, you know, you go there, you chant the Vedas, etc. Yes, that happens too. But there is a lot of other things that go on. They were taught law, they were taught uh, mathematics. And very importantly, they had an akhara, which was they were taught to do martial arts. And when I say martial arts, this is not just how akharas are today, just doing kushti. They were, they were taught arms, um, sword fighting, revolvers, everything. So there was this somewhat combination of scholarship and militancy in the family going back hundreds of years. So this is the family in which Sachin Sanyal is born in, in the end of the 19th century. And he's very influenced by Sri Aurobindo. Now Sri Aurobindo is today thought of as being a sadhu and so on. But he was an absolute firebrand at that time known as Aurobindo Ghosh. And he set up a network of Akhadas called the Anushilan Samiti. Now mind you, these people are young people, mostly young men, who are in many cases younger than the audience here. They were in their late teens. So as a 16 year old, Sachin Sanyal converted the family Akhara into a place for the Anushilan Samiti, where he began to train all these young men essentially to revolt against the British as part of the Anushilan Samiti network across India. And then because Sri Aurobindo is captured, then he escapes to Pondicherry, this particular phase breaks down. Before you go there, uh, Sanjeevta, I have a uh, small clarification here, which it is, uh, I mean, we have seen Akharas were centers of later revolutionary movements. Same with Anushilan in Kolkata and Dhaka. So one can understand that. The one thing I want to understand from you is how does the transition happen from the scholarly yet militant family to anti-British activities? So this is happening in 19th century Bengal anyway. So they have done all these rebellions against the British, the Indigo Rebellion, the Sanyasi Rebellion, and all of them have failed. So by this time, B Bengal, which had been the first place to be conquered by the British, by this time they are exhausted, right? They have fought the British several times and they've been crushed. And now they are facing Christian evangelization, westernization, so they don't know what to do. So there is a response that happens in multiple ways. So there is the response of the Orthodox who basically shut themselves off. There is the response of the Brahmos led by Raja Ram Mohan Roy of social reform. But there is another reform which is neither westernizing nor Orthodox, which is that of the modernizers. 
So the sannyas are a part of that modernizing phenomena. So you have Vivekanand, uh, you have uh, Bunkim Chandro, uh, there is uh, Vidya Sagar. So the sannyas and the wider clan, the Sanya Lahiri clan, they also participate in this. So, for example, they begin to modernize yoga. So, modern Kriya Yoga also comes from the same family. You may have heard of Lahiri Mahashoy in many cases. Lahiri Mahashoy, by the way, is the same family as Sachindranath Sanya's grand uncle. And he also comes from uh, the same place, the Bengali Tola area. They had a college that they set up called Bengali Tola Inter College. So, all of these fellows are trying to figure out how to basically fight against the British and subvert them, modernize themselves. Learn English. One of the strange things is they are very much into opposing the British, but they are very keen to learn English. So, this is an extension of what we call Bengal Renaissance? Absolutely. This is an extension of Bengal Renaissance in Varanasi, but a very militant version of it. Okay. So, I mean, you said, I mean, he starts, begins his revolutionary phase from around 1908. And that is the time which is very interesting in Bengal because uh, Aurobindo's uh, Jugantar, the Jugantar newspaper, I mean loosely the organization also came to be known as Jugantar. It was uh, different from the Anushilan Samiti. The arrests had started. The British uh, government had got to know about its revolutionary plans and everything and arrests had started. So when that organization is being squeezed in Bengal, Sachin Sanal in Varanasi is expanding his activities. So how do these two correlate? So what happens is Sachin Sanyal is doing his own thing and he has this uh, branch of the Anushilan Samiti is set up and of course the Anushilan Samiti is under, being uh, under investigation. So he quietly changes the name of his organization to something young men something something. Uh, but anyway, at this time he comes in touch with a boss called Rash Bihari Bose who was working as a clerk in Dehradun in the Forestry Research Institute. And they decide to throw, try and, they decide to try and assassinate the Viceroy, Viceroy Hardinge in 1912. And by the way, this event happens very, very close to here in Chandni Chowk. So in Chandni Chowk in 1912, what is happening? What is happening? That Delhi has just been made the capital of the country, been shifted from Kolkata to uh, Delhi. And a grand entry of is organized in which Viceroy Hardin, John an Elephant, will go through in a ceremonial march through Chandni Chowk and declare uh, Delhi as the capital. So, uh, Raj Bihari Bose, who was the elder of the two, decides they are going to do something to disrupt it. So, basically, they train a young boy who was also 16, 17 years old, Boshondo Bishash. And the three of them basically go I, somewhere near Parathe Wale Gali. I can imagine them standing there. Um, <clears throat> this is December. So, uh, December 1912, I can imagine them sitting there having their parathas in Parathe Wale Gali. And then what they do is they go to the top of a wholesaler market, which is also still there. Um, and from there, they throw a bomb on top of um, Hardinge. Uh, it's unclear whether Sachin Sanyal himself was there. It was a part of the plot, but he may or may not have been there. But Raj Bihari was there and Basundra Biswas was there. And they throw a bomb and they nearly managed to kill Lord Hardinge. Uh, his uh, uh, Mahut dies, but Lord Hardinge is very badly hurt. It takes him six months to recover. But he survives. He's the guy who, by the way, builds uh, uh, North Block, South Block, yeah. uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan, Latians, Delhi and so on. And so it turned out somewhat ironically that uh, almost a hundred years later, I ended up working in North Block. <laughs> and I did check out some of the underground tunnels that they are there. By the way, North Block and South Block have various escape routes uh, uh, designed specifically to escape re revolutionaries. That, that is amazing. Uh, but there is another <laughs> comic uh, aspect to this, which I can't help note, is that the Britishers leave Calcutta, tired of the revolutionaries, scared of them, that let's just leave this place and go and find a new place. So they come and set up Delhi. And here comes three Bengali guys chasing them. And one of them in sari, <laughs> disguised in sari, and throwing a bomb on the... On, on yes, the Raj Bihari Bose and all of these people then scatter using old Delhi railway station. And Raj Bihari Bose goes to um, Dehradun 
and organizes an event at the uh, Forestry Research Institute to condemn the throwing of the bomb. And then he did such a good job of it that six months later when Lord Hardinge visited Dehradun, he actually was made the head of the welcoming committee. So once this phase, this is one of the phases. Actually, Sachin Sanal's life is more remarkable because he has seen so many phases. So this is phase one. This is phase one. And next one is the culmination of the Gadar movement, which also ends in failure. And what happens there? Why? So what? Gadar movement is a very important movement. So let me tell you about it because if we had been a little lucky, we could have become free in 1915. So what happens is that the Gadar movement happens during the first phase of the First World War, in which basically Raj Bihari Bose and Sachin Sanyal decide that they are going to try and cause a revolt in the British Indian Army. And they decide a date in the middle of February when they are going to cause this big revolt. And they infiltrate all the reg Indian regiments across India. And it's supposed to start out in a cantonment in Lahore. And then it's going to go across the country. Unfortunately, at the last minute, just two days before this revolt was supposed to trigger, what happens is that uh, one of the people switch sides. So what happens is that just two days before it's going to take, uh, this thing's going to happen, the British find out that this massive revolt is going to happen in the British Indian Army. And remember, they don't have troops to send back to India because they are all in... In, in France fighting the Germans. So overnight what they do is they change all the guards of the armories from being Indian to being European. So all of a sudden the Indian troops do not have access to their guns. And so this revolt fails except interestingly in Singapore where they haven't heard what has happened. And so there is a revolt in Sing Singapore and the Indian regiment in Singapore actually holds Singapore for a full week. But other than that, this revolt fails. There are small uprisings here and there, but ultimately an utter disaster. But it came within an inch of succeeding. <laughs> and of course, Rash Bihari Bose uh, dresses up as a cousin of Tagore, called P.N. Tagore. He gets on a tri uh, uh, onto a ship and escapes to Japan. But Sachin Sanyal is captured from Varanasi. And they ship him, they, many of his, by the way, colleagues are hanged, including some from Delhi, by the way. And then he is shipped off to Kalapani. That's the first time he would go to Kalapani for five years. He would go, uh, be shipped off to Kalapani. Yes. No, the, and he writes about this. Bandi Jeevan is a lot about this phase right, of his life. Right. And that, that would have been a fascinating phase of his life. Because a lot of uh, firebrand revolutionaries from Bengal are there at the same time. So is Savarkar. And... Uh, what happens, this is a period when the first world war is going on. And when the world war comes to an end, there is a transition to a new phase. That is also the phase which coincides with the emergence of Gandhi. So Gandhi comes into the picture and after the uh, war ends, uh, uh, Sanal, Sachin Sanal and others are released on clemency. So they come back and see a new movement taking up. How do they respond to that? So, remember what goes on and why they are released in the first place. This happens because, you see, remember all those soldiers almost revolted in the First World War? Well, they went to the First World War, they fought those wars and they are coming back in all the ships in 1919, all these ships are coming back with these troops to Punjab, to Maharashtra. And they had already been radicalized before they had left. They are now veterans and they have lost the fear of killing the white man. Now what happens is the British are very afraid that these fellows will revolt. So they introduce all these very severe rules called the Rowlett Acts. And, that, and they try to suppress these things. By the way, this results in a series of massacres which includes and culminates in Jallianwala Bagh massacre. But do remember the Jallianwala Bagh massacre is only one of several massacres that happened, particularly in Punjab, and because of the fear of these uh, Gadarites coming right. back and revolting again. Right. So it becomes a very big deal. The British are on a back foot. So as a peace offering, they release a bunch of these revolutionaries. One of them is Sachin Sanyal. So he comes back to the mainland and he actually attends the Nagpur conference where 
with tilak having just died gandhi becomes the leader of the congress but what is less remembered is that sachin sanyal also spoke in that same conference and he made a case for releasing all the political prisoners in kalapani because he realized that nobody knew what was happening in kalapani you see the torturing this this you know literally uh, pushing people to commit suicide in kalapani that was going on was not widely known outside so sachin salial actually made a very big plea but of course that is not remembered what is remembered is the launch of the non cooperation movement and so there is this two years in which gandhi becomes the dominant power using ahimsa now sachin sanyal is somewhat skeptical of this he is a revolutionary and a hardcore shakta uh, with a tradition of lopping people's heads off as i pointed out so he keeps quietly keeps away now this non cooperation movement ends with chaudhary chaura gandhi suddenly arbitrarily withdraws the whole movement just about at the time that it was about to become successful there are a large number of young people who are disillusioned with this so sachin sanyal now goes back in and begins to recruit so he recruits all these people whose names you may have heard this is the time when he recruits ram prasad bismil rajendra lahiri ashwakulla khan bhagat singh who was a college student um sukhdev uh, sukhdev uh, rajguru chandrashekhar azad who was a young kid in varanasi in sanskrit college these people all of whose names you know are actually recruits of sachindranath sanyal and as a part of that he then set up something called the hindustan republican association and under it he created the hindustan republican army now the name is very interesting because it is directly inspired by the irish republican army so the people don't know this but the irish were a huge inspiration because they had just become free at that time and the irish they said those fellows tiny country right next to britain can become free then how are we sitting around what are we doing here so in 1923 sets up the hra and he begins to recruit all these people and this cycle ends of course with several attacks and various things but ultimately with the kakodi uh, rain ro- train robbery because the hra had a serious problem it was importing all these german mauser pistols and guns didn't have money to pay for it so what they did is they got a very good swimmer he was a champion india's best swimmer at that time forget his name gone off my mind anyway they sent him off to germany to participate in a swimming competition and so he participates in a swimming competition but his real job is to reach out to the mauser company to get them for these pistols so they send a whole carton of pistols and they they can't come into indian waters because they'll be captured so this german ship comes and goes outside of indian waters in international waters in the bay of bengal and a chap called rajendra lahiri who is also another grand uncle of mine takes a fishing boat out from dakshineshwar out into the sea takes these guns brings them back in and they are distributed all over um india and these guns are then used but there's a problem here they don't have the money to pay for it so what do they do they decide to raid a train outside of lucknow in a place called kakodi same place after which the kakodi kebab by the way is named so they go there and they rob this train and they get a lot of money they do manage to pay the germans but they make a big mistake and the mistake is that they d- did not realize that all the notes are numbered and the british were keeping track of the numbering system this is quite new at that time numbered notes and the british basically managed to figure out where this money gets spent they f- trace it back and many of these people bismil etc are captured and hanged and sachin sanyal is yet again sent off to um kalapani for 10 years this time all the family properties are um, taken away so my branch of the family ends up in prayagraj then called alahabad uh, which is one of the reasons that chandrashekhar azad got killed in alahabad some years later because he was coming to our house before, before he got uh, identified by a writer called yashpal by the way uh, and and was killed or rather he killed himself to be precise um so yes so this second phase also ends in disaster 
Uh, it just struck me that probably it is because of the influence of this, uh, of their activity in Varanasi that we haven't seen a proper Gandhian or Nehruvian leader in the Congress emerging from Varanasi. We have seen the likes of Sampunanad, who was the socialist, even uh, Purushottam Dastandan, who was a uh, conventional uh, conservative, but not in the strictest sense the Nehruvian or Gandhian. So it has al al always maintained a separate path of its own. Now, coming back to the main thing, I mean, so he goes back to, he sent back to Kalapani again. So that's the end of another phase. But that is the phase when two things happen. There is a re-emergence of the revolutionary activities like in the Chittagong Amari raid, Master the Surya Sen comes up and... Uh, yeah, these similar, are all his followers. These are all his followers. They, I mean, they take up a new phase of revolutionary aggressiveness, revolutionary aggression. And the British Raj is really scared. But what happens at the same time is that the revolutionary organization gets split uh, into uh, two halves. A significant part goes off to the communist ideology. They walk over to the communist ideology. Those who stay back, they work in a different mindset or mind space. So when Sachin Sanal is released in 1937, when he comes back, again, like the last time, Again, a new phase is turning in, in Indian politics. The new Constitution India or Government of India Act 1935 has come into operation. Congress has now set formed government in the different provinces. So he is looking, a revolutionary of his stature is looking into a complete constitutional framework where there is no scope for him to, uh, should I, I mean, let me put it this way that to carry on with his old area of activity and the organization is destroyed. Yeah. So what does he do there? So as you correctly pointed out, so he gets sent off and his organization for some time keeps fighting. So Bhagat Singh, for example, by the way, Bhagat Singh by this point is getting, becoming more and more communist. It is he who changes the name of Hindustan Republican Association to adding the word socialist. Socialist. So it becomes HS, HSRA. Yeah, HSRA. Yeah. And not everybody is convinced by the introduction of this and do remember the Sachin Sanyal himself was vehemently anti-Marxist. So, uh, in fact, um, uh, in Why I'm an Atheist, which Bhagat Singh writes, it's a pamphlet he writes in jail, he mentions specifically uh, that Sachin Sanyal would not have been terribly happy about his, uh, his right. ideas. But anyway, this entire bunch of this phase of uh, uh, his followers get basically decimated. So, Rajguru and Bhagat Singh and Sukhdev get hanged. Um, Chandrasekhar Azad is, cap is surrounded in Alfred Park in Lahabad and killed. Surjo Sen and company, their entire group is killed. Many or many others are. So by 1933-34, the organization that he had built has been completely decimated. And so he comes back in 1937 after 10 years in jail and he's alone. And by the way, he still hasn't stopped giving up this idea of causing a, a revolt in the Indian army. But he doesn't have an organization. So he's, he's, by the way, not allowed to go to Bengal. He's not allowed to come to Delhi. He's not allowed to go to Punjab. He's only allowed to be in central UP. And he's not, I think he's not even allowed to go back to his old hometown of Varanasi. Varanasi. So he can go to Allahabad, he can go to Gorakhpur, but he may, sets up camp in Lucknow, in old Lucknow. And the S sidelines of the 1938 to 1937 Durga Puja, I think it was 1930 Durga Puja, he meets Netaji Subhash Bose, who has been newly ousted from the presidentship of the not Congress. Yet, not yet. Not yet. So he but he's talking against the Gandhian line. Ha, so maybe, some... maybe at that time. So it was 38. 38. Think, yeah. So this is at the sidelines of the, of the um, Durga Puja, they meet. In fact, I mean, but uh, Since you are the boss expert, you probably know the dates better. <laughs> no, not the dates only. But the thing is that uh, I uh, saw a very interesting newspaper clipping at that time where uh, Subhas Bose was recuperating in Dalhousie, staying with the governor at that time. And Sachin Sanal goes to meet him uh, at Dalhousie and the, he stopped at the border and he is sent back. So the British is well aware the potential of exchange of ideas. It's, it's not that, I mean, Sachin Sanal has come back from so many years of imprisonment, but the British definitely does not look at him as a retired revolutionary, although he does not have an organization yet. No, no. He, and by the way, he, is, uh, he doesn't mince his words. He's spreading, he's writing fairly inflammatory things even after coming back from jail after 10 years. So, 
uh, he is he is not uh, exactly a retired revolutionary at all um <clears throat> and so he meets by the way meanwhile he is also in touch with rash bihari bose in japan and by the way this book the version of the book that i have translated comes into its is basically finalized in that time as well so he's sitting in lucknow and finalizing this book he also writes an english translation of this book himself which he wants to publish in english but and he sends a copy of it to england because nobody in india dares to publish it so he, ironically it was easier to try and publish no. uh, inflammatory literature Always. in britain than it was in india so he sends it to england but there is a letter which is there in this book which i have written which is written by the intelligence agencies in india to india house people in london saying that such and such book is coming across make sure it, you don't let it be published so anyway so this But is what happened to the manuscript so i have not found that manuscript i had to retranslate it um but meanwhile what happens is uh, he then gets in touch with again the indian um regiments this time because subhash bose is involved and they have a better network in bengal they infiltrate actually the punjab regiment in fort william this is remember 1939 the war in europe has just about started the war in asia has not started at all the japanese are not involved yeah. yet yeah. but the british are aware of all of this so one of the things to grant the british is they actually had amazing intelligence because no matter what these fellows were doing i have found letters mentioning between the british who were talking amongst themselves saying that these guys are doing this these guys are doing that and so they ba- basically arrest sachin sanyal they also arrest subhash bose subhash bose of course famously escapes and then he goes to germany and then ultimately uh, ends up in singapore but sachindranath sanyal is captured and sent off and kept in jail i think it was in bareilly jail initially and then gorakhpur where he is deliberately infected with tuberculosis tb he is put in a room with a tb patient who was clearly infectious and so he captures tb as well and in the next 18 months he becomes very badly infected and ultimately dies of tb so sachin sanyal did not live to see independence but his idea of causing a revolt in the british indian army does happen in ina in singapore that is what i mean the dreams of so many revolutionaries of his time sachin sanyal uh, jatindranath mukherjee rash bihari that was ultimately fulfilled by subhash bose absolutely at the end of it at the end of it it happens and of course even that fails and then ultimately you have the last great revolt the naval revolt the of naval 1946 which finally leads to freedom so seen this history seen from the perspective of revolutionaries india grants its freedom through armed revolt and there are these several attempts to do it it happens in 1857 there's the attempt in 1915 there is the attempt in 1943 to 45 and then finally in 46 they succeed but i think two topics that you need to talk about one yeah we'll do two question then open it up yeah yeah so one is the importance of uh, grounding himself in the traditional hindu uh, teaching system the hindu cosmology the scriptures and training proper training how important was it for sachin sanal because it was very important for a lot of revolutionaries particularly those associated with anushilan and jugandhar arobind of course everybody knows but even the beginning of anushilan was from that perspective so this is was a, was a line of thought which never could trounce the official narrative that got established after 1947 but probably this is something that we need to look into absolutely uh, um, um, in fact specifically shakta hinduism shakti worshiping hinduism the hinduism of worshiping the female uh, particularly in the fierce form so bengalis of course are famous for worshiping kali and durga and so on but this is a long tradition in the rest of the country as well and this tradition is there in uh, maharashtra the worshiping of Bha- bhavani so the maratha empire shivaji all of them were bhavani worshipers this is also there in punjab not many people realize that the sikhs particularly the last few sikh gurus are shakta worshipers so guru gobind singh essentially got a sword from durga so this tradition of shakta worshiping and of somewhat militant opposition to foreign domination 
is a very strongly embedded thing in uh, in india generally would it make them less secular in today's world i think uh, sachindranath sanyal would not have considered himself secular in the today's sense but he was certainly not uh, uh, what should i say he was not an orthodox um, if you go back and look at the constitution of the hra he talks about a democratic republic which includes votes to everybody he is not talking about a uh, religious or monarchical form of government but he is very much rooted in uh, shakta literature shakta thinking and by the way all the revolutionaries when they were inducted they would go through a, um, a, a ritual of being in, incorporated into the anushilan yeah. samiti and that's very much a religious um, um, the oath of secrecy yeah, the oath of secrecy and, and the way they would do it is interestingly they would have a sword or revolver in one hand yeah. and on the other hand they would have either a rig veda or a bhagavad gita which is interesting because bhagavad gita is 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 a version of not narrowly a version of text but is a version of text but it is a call to action and the oath was usually done to bhavani or kali or durga and so that is the context in which so no, i asked this question specifically yes. specifically because for decade after decade it has been the uh, critique of the leftist historians that the revolutionary movement was hindu nationalistic it was i mean it's very and well documented i mean i mean that's not saying in a sense of praising <laughs> you know that but uh, i mean it's posed it's posited against secularism anti secular kind of thing no so, so i think debate so i think this um the uh, the revolutionaries were not uh, apologetic about their hinduism absolutely it is one section of the revolutionaries who by the way after leaving the revolutionary movement became communists communists the com- after becoming communists they did not fight against the british the communist party of india in fact sided with the british against the ina and subhash bose during the second world war this is on record yeah so it is important to remember that the com but what is also interesting is that many of these revolutionaries did become communists yeah one section one section became communist the other section became ministers so <laughs> both of them <laughs> um, the other thing other question uh, i mean last question is i want to understand from the, since you have written this book read it rewritten it uh, the counterpoint of sachin sanal's uh, ideology as a gandhian uh, as a counter view of gandhian ideology Yes I mean one important thing I do want to make is that he had huge respect for Gandhi though in the sense that he agreed with the I, the Gandhi had done something that his movement would not have been able to do which is to get literally everybody to stand up and begin to participate in some way because his method by nature was violent and so not everybody is willing to stand up and get themselves killed so Sachin Sanyal himself understood the limitations of his method and he was grateful in some ways to even the Gandhians for uh, getting wider political uh, uh, sort of involvement so uh, having put that caveat aside he however believed that in the end you had to meet a bullet with a bullet so while Gandhi was useful it was not what would get us freedom so you see that he repeatedly in fact he debated gandhi in the young india uh, and gandhi to be fair published his uh, these question answers although he didn't write it in his own name i forget the name he used he used some, some militant sounding uh, pseudonym but anyway he, there was a, a debate between gandhi and sachin sanyal in the pages of young india over a period of uh, several months and in which he makes the case that look in the end you have to stand up and there has to be armed resistance to this br- br- brutal brutal regime and of course uh, in the eyes of those of the 1922 he had won the argument because the non cooperation movement was in shambles and basically people were flocking to him he, uh, gandhi had famously promised swaraj in one year yes. if, if the revolution is followed him, which which is i think the uh, massive victory for the revolution is that yeah so he he has this huge following and then for a while it really gathers pace and and f- between 1923 and 33 there is this huge revolutionary phase which ends with of course the various hangings the the chitagong armed robbery etc 
and then completely dies out till being revived in the last two phases by uh, Subhash Bose and the and the and the uh, but in the last revolt. count, Sajib, the, I think uh, it it is. A we'll have to let the open yeah. it up for questions this now. This is the last question. In the last phase, uh, your opinion on this is, I think, inform a lot of people here. Is uh, in the last phase, rather than winning freedom through the revolutionary struggle, the entire thing moved to negotiation. So that probably was letting down the revolutionary fervor, well, which was reigning in the country. To be fair, that to the to, what happened by 1946 when the naval revolt happens is that none of the revolutionary leaders were alive. So, um, you know, Sachin Sali himself is dead, Raj Bihari Bose is dead, uh, 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 Netaji is dead or missing, dead. whatever you uh, believe. Um, all of the Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar, all of these guys are dead. So, the revolutionary, the last act of the revolutionary movement of the naval mutiny happens without any leadership. So, there's nobody from the revolutionary side to actually do any negotiating. Ironically, the two people who started the movement, Savarkar and Sri Aurobindo, they actually lived to see independence. But both of them had left the movement by that point. For which, by the way, uh, Sachin Sanyal was somewhat bitter about the matter. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Now, I think it's time we can, to open yeah, We are now uh, two questions and then we have to, I think, move on to the next session. I have this question in my mind, like uh, the formation of uh, forward bloc in 1939. So, is it somewhere related to the influence of uh, Sachin Sanyal or uh, um, like uh, the forward bloc was formed no, in... No, it is a somewhat different event that happens. What happens is that the... Um, that Subhash Bose basically wins the election uh, in the Congress against the Gandhians. Now, what happens as a result of this is that the Gandhians decide to subvert him organizationally. So, he has the popular vote, but the organization is being subverted. So, now, as a result of that, if effectively, Bose is pushed out of the, um, of, the, of, the, of, the of the presidentship. So, what he does is that he is now trying to basically politically try to rebuild himself. So, he has two groups of people two, three groups of people support him, but two particular groups. Initially, it's the socialists or the left-leaning people and secondly, the former uh, revolutionaries who are now called, you can call them the Jugantar nationalists. There is two support groups. So, one of them are his old support group going back to the times of Chitranjan Das, etc. But this new group, he tries to organize themselves and make sure they don't get captured by the communists. In fact, he's actually suspicious of the communists. So, he creates a bloc called the forward bloc. Initially, as a inside the Congress, not separate party, inside the con Congress. And so, this is what he's doing. This is happening simultaneously with when he is talking to Sachindranath Sanyal, who, by the way, is a part of the story, but not of the forward bloc story. He's a part of the story in terms of working with uh, both in trying to connect through to the Japanese. That is the bit in which Sachin Sanyal is involved, not in the forward work part, because Sachin Sanyal was not really by this point, uh, did not have any organization with him at all. He was a loner. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the revolutionary had split. Actually, they had split their support to Subhash Bose, and Sachin Sanyal was working closely with Subhash Bose at this time. So, we don't know a lot of things that went on between them. Yeah, so you have to remember a lot of things we don't actually know because all of this is between them and they, they are neither of them lived after to independence India to tell us what happened. My question is to you, Data, do you think there is the means number of peop uh, people who have made big contribution in the independence of India, someone has sacrificed their life and there are number of people in our country who does not know and uh, understand their struggle in the freedom, freedom struggle of the country. And uh, currently in our country means uh, um, some people we know, uh, those who are famous and those who have seen uh, independence since last time. What do you think? So if you combine that with the next question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, some very two direct historical questions. Two questions, but one. One is, was there an interaction between Sanyal and Savarkar? That is one, while they were in cellular jail. And is there a description of David Barry? David Barry is the yeah. jailer, quote-unquote jailer. 
so they they did uh, they did meet each other in savarkar and sanyal were very much in his first time when he was in jail between 15 and 20 they were very much in touch of course there was their interactions were limited because they were in individual cells and they were only allowed out to work on the oil mills and other things so it's not like they're hanging around sharing a coffee and chatting it's not doing an adda but they did interact with each other but what happens is that having come out of jail in 1920 after the jallianwala bag episode sachin sanyal tries very hard to get both savarkar and bhai parmanand released so in fact he goes to uh, bhu which had just been set up to meet uh, madan mohan malviya for help but madan mohan malviya listens him out doesn't really provide too much support it's written by the way in bandi jeevan so then he attends the nagpur conference where he stands up on stage and he makes an impassioned plea to the public that look you have to do something about these prisoners and the person on stage with him is narayan savarkar savarkar's youngest brother so he was very much in touch with the savarkars uh, throughout this uh, whole episode um <clears throat> and then what happens is um so yes so to answer your question yes he was in touch which by the way fits with the question uh, answer to the f- next question is that at the time of independence essentially although the revolutionaries had made many contributions they actually end up with none of their senior leaders becoming uh, a part of the post independence india because most of them by the way had died the only two who had survived as i mentioned of any seniority of the movement were shri arobindo who had gone off into spiritual life and savarkar and savarkar interestingly is tied up in uh, the episode relating to uh, the assassination of gandhi so what is interesting is you have to remember where the revolutionaries came from they came from basically three provinces others also contributed but i would say 80% came from three provinces bengal united bengal united punjab and maharashtra and some came from up and other places also but these three big provinces now all three cases look at what happens at the time of independence punjab and bengal are partitioned many of the revolutionaries in fact the bulk of the revolutionaries in fact came from the part that ended up in west or east pakistan so at the point of independence the revolutionaries are not celebrating they are actually desperately trying to save their lives their houses are being burned their riots are happening they are actually scampering across the border trying to find somewhere to live so far from participating in rebuilding india they are rebuilding literally their own lives so this is what happens in bengal and west punjab okay S- meanwhile in what happens to the maharashtra in maharashtra the although all communities participated in uh, the the revolutionary movement it was the brahmins in particular who had been at the forefront why because they had been at the forefront of the maratha empire as well and so the british had been always very scared of this lot and they had been continuously trying to sow anti brahmanism which still exists in maharashtra now what happens is that of course the other two communities have got decimated by partition a few months later a member of the maharashtrian brahmin community assassinates gandhi and there are massive riots in maharashtra against the brahmins thousands of them are killed tens of thousands of their homes are burnt their businesses are burnt something not many people know about today you hardly hear anything written about it and it is barely reported in the press of that time you read over ha some riots happened something happened so in fact the riot anti brahmin riots of 1948 are in some ways a precursor of the riots that happened against the sikhs in 1984 against another community that had fought for indian uh, revolutionary war and of course the bengalis of course go through repeated things like morijhapi and other things east bengalis face all these so all the communities that had played an important role in india's revolutionary resistance to the british all three of them were basically dev- devastated by uh, independent india and ignored 
and treated really badly. And it is only in, 19, uh, in 2022, finally, that the last few remaining soldiers of the Indian National Army were finally taken on the Republic Day Parade. In 2022. So, this entire history of the revolutionary contribution to India's history was wiped out. Even cellular jail, by the way, was almost entirely demolished. Till there was a huge outcry and the little bit you see today when you go to Port Blair, that was somehow uh, kept. Similar thing happened with Mamsi. By the way, Mamsi, Maulana Azad Medical College is the site of Delhi jail where many revolutionaries were kept. Many of them were hanged there. And in 1950s, when it was being pulled down and converted to a college, the revolutionaries had requested that at least the place where the gallows were should be maintained as a uh, some uh, uh, as a uh, uh, in memory of the revolutionaries and even that was flattened out and nothing was left so their memory was basically wiped out the communities who had contributed most of the revolutionaries were wiped out so in the end the revolutionaries got what they wanted which was an independent india but they themselves um uh, probably not the way they wanted the, yeah they, they themselves however did not uh, uh, benefit much from it Thank you, Sajibda, for a fascinating talk on a fascinating person and, a, and his memoirs.